Subendu, Dr. Subendu Boral, and then we have uh, Dr. Gopal Pillay, Dr. Mohit Dogra is sharing the stage with me here, and of course, Dr. Malika Hello, Goel, you. madam. So, without wasting much time, I think we'll straight away go ahead with the video presentations. So, the first talk uh, will be by Dr. Lalit Verma, sir, who will be speaking on macular hole with the posterior pole RD, especially in cases of uh, high myopia. Yeah, thank Over you, Srinivas, uh, because once we are uh, doing a VR surgery, sometimes, you know, uh, an undiagnosed macular hole, uh, you know, uh, crops up. So, thanks to everybody for this. You see, in myopia and detachment, there could be various combinations, uh, which could be a peripheral break, DRT, or peripheral tear, macular hole, shysis. So many things are there with myopia. And classic teaching when, uh, you know, uh, we started is to see the petrol break and forget everything about it. But today, I think uh, with MIVS, we, uh, you know, go from inside and in such patients which have both, it's the double trouble actually, double trouble patients, we, you know, uh, do a VR and peel the ILM and it works very well. So I'll show you only three videos here. This was one patient who, who made me alarmed, who made me alarmed that we had not diagnosed macular hole in this patient. This patient was a myope, but had a reg RD, but bullous RD, and we had seen two, three breaks in the periphery. So macula actually was not visible, and the bulla was hanging over the macula. But once I started doing, to my uh, surprise, we saw a macular hole here. The reason uh, we started then doing OCT in all the patients of reg RD, because the problem is that in case macular hole is not diagnosed, patient uh, may start blaming the surgery itself. And hence the, shall we stop? Come, come, come. Can't afford to sit there. So only two, three point, two, three videos I'll show. Malika. So uh, I am showing this two, three videos only, Malika. This was one patient of Bullas RD where uh, I had not diagnosed uh, because I had shown, seen two, three HSTs. So macular hole was diagnosed on the table. So trouble with me was that, uh, you know, patient will start uh, criticizing me that I have created this macular hole. So, and this patient, after this patient, I've started doing OCT in all patients of RD also. Now. So uh, in this patient, uh, the routine surgery was done. Only thing is, I, f I, I prefer to peel ILM in a flat macula rather than in a detached retina. So I will, uh, you know, inject uh, PFCL, flatten the macula, and then uh, inject this uh, dye, BBG. And under the weight of PFCL, once this, uh, you know, liquid has been drained out from the peripheral break, or, or, the, or the fluid is shifted in the periphery, I will, uh, you know, take this uh, direct pinch and peel technique. And in this patient, uh, we, we, we peeled the ILM. We didn't create any flap. You see this, uh, because this, the behavior of the ILM in this patient is different because under the weight of PFCL, it will roll on. It will scroll like this. But uh, peeling is not difficult in such patients if you do under the PFCL. At least for me, I do not uh, want to pull the retina once I am peeling this uh, ILM. So this was a straightforward patient. This is another patient who had... Uh, you know, macular hole and the and the uh, detachment. So we did this vitrectomy. The difference between that patient and this patient here, here <coughs> we had done a flap rather than uh, a, a peel. The surgery was more or less similar. Inject PFCL, flatten the posterior pole, which was detached initially. And since uh, I created retinotomy closer to the uh, arcade, because I wanted the fluid to be out, because peripheral breaks I had not diagnosed uh, preoperatively. So and then inject this BBG dye, and similar technique, uh, direct pinch and peel technique. The whole size was pretty large, and the choroid, uh, you know, visibly looked atrophic. And uh, instead of uh, taking it across the macular hole, we left it at the edge, like all of us uh, do, a flap technique. So this was left like this at the end of surgery. 
and then we tackle the peripheral retina dead laser and this was the end result of this patient this was the pre and post picture of this patient reasonably satisfactory outcome the third patient which i wanted to discuss was this high myope uh, uh, in fact very high myope uh, more than 25 diopters of uh, myopia this lady 55 year old and uh, we started as usual with the pvd induction and since the vitreous uh, flow this was so good that i thought uh, we have taken care of the vitreous and it was freely flowing into the mouth of the cutter like you see here so i thought pvd is complete but uh, in high myopes always reinject tricot two three times to show you see in the periphery uh, once i was removing this applied only suction at this time and the whole sheet of schisis was still there the posterior layer was still there so advocacy is that in high myopes at least uh, for pvd induction tricot may be required uh, you know more than once to take care of this last sheet of uh, uh, schisis which is uh, coming up so and this was actually you know removed in a all across started from temporal side then along the disc and then nasal side we could lift up the entire sheet of the vitreous which had to come out otherwise such surgery would have been a failure and post operative pvr chances are very very high in such patients so in myopes we should be very very careful then did the same procedure did a retinotomy the purpose of doing retinotomy is that uh, once i inject pfcl the posterior pole should be flat and the fluid is drained out from here the difference here is that the contrast at the posterior pole because of uh, pathological myopia was not very good so in such patients uh, you start uh, near the arcade you lift up the ilm near the arcade only so we start in a relatively uh, better stained area near the arcade although fovea is far away and then once the edges are identified then the job becomes simpler and never lose this edge sometimes uh, you may lose the because of the poor contrast you may lose this here again because of the high myopes in all this high myopes instead of peeling i will create a flap because the uh, pump function is in any case is not very good so at the post, at right at the fovea the contrast is very poor otherwise uh, from the periphery you can lift up this membrane and bring it to the center so this uh, multilayer flap was created from all across the posterior pole and then uh, the rest of the surgery was done this is the pre and post op clinical picture the posterior pole rd you can see here and this is the post op picture although it may not look good but ultimately patient gained 6 by 18 uh, vision in this patient this is the pre op oct here and this is the post op uh, oct in this same patient so these are the three uh, videos which i had to share as i said now i started doing oct in all patients of regardi wherever i am operating to rule out macular hole because i don't want to be blamed myself and uh, because prognosis and uh, may get affected and ilm surgery under pfcl i feel is better than uh, in a detached retina in high myopes even if you think there is pvd do in jet try cut uh, another time to just to take out this second membrane and flap may be better in all this high myopes rather than the peeling thank you very much uh, for your kind attention thank you sir for very informative videos any questions for him so you said you would do oct for all your patients uh, for macular hole which means any patient of regardi where you have a obvious horseshoe tear and all you will do you see, first first video i showed uh, we had two three horseshoe tears so we put for surgery because the patch was bullous so once we started doing it me i noticed the macular hole so, so how uh, easy is it to do the oct and to interpret it when the posterior <laughs> pole is kind of bullous it's not difficult unless unless uh, you know macular is not visible sometimes with the balloon of the uh, retina it may not be 
but in majority of times it is uh, you can make out that there is no metal bullet in this thing because i don't want to be blamed because uh, you see double trouble the possibility is that this patient may not recover 6x6 six six or you know 6x9 or 12 but uh, if macula is you know uh, there is no macula hole then there is all the possibility so this patient i had difficulty in counseling also this this hole was i had to show him the video also but this hole was there before this so that is why i have started doing oct in all patients oh. and the second point you made was that you preferred to do ilm peel always under the pfcl because you don't want it to be pulling out the yeah the reason vishali is that if the retina is uh, moving around and i do ilm so this retina i am pulling it away from the receptors more and more and the distortion may be more so i want it to be flat flat and then peel the ilm so did you ever have a small bubble of pfcl going under the macular hole in any of your patients fortunately not fortunately not uh, but it can happen unless uh, you know because we have to take care of all the traction at least at the posterior pole first so i think it's also very important that when we are injecting in macular hole we do it as a single this thing and no fish eggs yeah, because you are expert fish. but yeah. then uh, so you know very nice point very nice point that in such patients always use a dual bore cannula rather than uh, you know using a single this thing because with the dual bore the possibility of fish checking is away and yeah. always start from the nasal side of the disc rather than uh, you know over the and in these patients would you uh, besides the ilm peel like you showed the beautiful flap but in case you decide not to have a flap you remove the pfcl do you put your extrusion at the edge of the hole at the end when you are doing fluid gas exchange to make it smaller never you don't do never. that yeah in that's fact, what i used to do it i used to combine uh, maybe 3 4 years back i used to do with a 25 gauge uh, you know this uh, backflush needle i will not go over it but just yeah, the at the remain, edge yeah, yeah at the edge, edge or maybe above it and one one blob will come and it will settle down and sometimes you know in a recurrent or re then i will slightly massage it with the help of uh, so that to bring the uh, edges together so that sometimes i still do in a large macular hole so as to approximate these edges with the help of uh, an old diamond duster not a fresh diamond duster but an old diamond duster just to approximate the edges i will not use a backflush needle i will use a diamond duster to approximate thank you just of time we need next so the next speaker thank you dr verma excellent video please come forward in the uh, interest of time we move on uh, dr srinivas joshi will speak on complex rd with proliferative diabetic retinopathy uh, thank you madam thank you malika madam for involving me in this uh, interesting uh, session uh, uh, interesting course on uh, retinal detachment so quickly i'll move on through the few of the cases i don't know why video is not playing वीडियो प्ले नहीं हो रहा है एनीवे लीव इट लेट्स गो टू द नेक्स्ट वीडियो सो दिस वाज अ केस ऑफ अ वेरी कॉम्प्लेक्स टीआरडी एज यू कैन सी हियर द पेशेंट प्रेजेंटेड विद पीएल पॉजिटिव एंड पीआर एक्यूरेट सो आई थॉट लेट लेट मी ट्राई बिकॉज़ इट शी वाज हैविंग दिस बायलैटरली द सेम कंडीशन सो दिस वाज एक्चुअली द फर्स्ट फ्यू केसेस आई वाज ऑपरेटिंग इन 2017 यूजिंग द 3D इंजीनिटी मशीन so i thought that there was a learning curve but after this that gave me a little bit of more strength and stability as you can see here i'm just doing a cutter segmentation and thanks to these modern gauge cutters that uh, most of these cutting can be done with the help of uh, uh, the 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 cutter itself and this is the and whenever it comes to periphery i think we should not hesitate to move on to the bimanual uh, using a chandelier light Uh, as you can see here uh, the peripherally was looking almost a little bit sclerosed so here is the fold back delamination as described by dr steve charles so i'm just trying to remove as much as possible and of course uh, uh, trying to do it until the periphery is very very important especially the inferior area where we don't want to have a recurrent detachment or the pvr along with that so uh, finally removing the m- little more bit remnants of the the membrane here and once we try to remove it and now put a pfo and try to laser uh, uh the breaks as well as uh, do a complete prp 
and uh, silicon oil was injected and this is the the hand movements and luckily the patient improved to 2080 the post op in this case now coming to the next set of cases where we don't have it's a table top kind of trd where we don't have the edge then be the better is to use the pick here and once we use the pick uh, then the dissection becomes a uh, little more easier uh, as you can see here i'm lifting it and trying to do a segmentation and Uh, of course you can change the hand if you want to go on to the nasal side it's always better uh, some people try to use the visco dissection as well but i'm uh, pretty much uh, comfortable with this and here my favorite technique is to do a 360 degree truncation so here i'm trying to do an outside in technique although inside out technique as also uh, works in most of the cases but here you can see i'm just trying to peel from the periphery because it was the membrane was coming out uh, pretty much easier so i did not want to do Uh, start from inside out so here now you can see the uh, the fold back with the co conformal segmentation i'm trying to remove most of this membrane and you can see once it is detached how easily it comes to the cutter and uh, the efficiency and the precision of the cutters have also improved now these are the and the set of i just wanted to show that there was no free edge ioct also can be of help in these kind of cases uh, where you can see where is the cleavage in this as you can see i'm not getting any this uh, uh, good a cleavage here to dissect it so now with the ioct uh, you can see those gap uh, clefts kind of thing and uh, you can always start your cutting uh, instrument or whatever you use whether the pick here i had to use a pick here so once i use the pick i i i i just keep seeing on the screen because it gets noted on the ingenuity screen as well uh so you can identify where is the cleft and go ahead and then start dissecting it so so once you get a good cleavage then the dissection becomes pretty much easier as you can see here i'm just trying to lift it and then do a cutter segmentation and along with that the cutter delamination as well so the the case went pretty faster once i got the a good cleavage and the grip and now you can see within few minutes this got over and unnecessary unindicated ilm peeling can be avoided using the ioct where there is no macular edema or no remnants then no, no need of doing ilm peeling now this is another case where you can see with the help of the ioct here you can see the cleavage very well uh, so that the dissection becomes easier and where to put the instrument also becomes pretty much easier so that to have a less so this is now you can see there is a mac hole which was not seen at all uh, which we did not expect it uh, uh, because there is a uh vitreous hemorrhage in this case and again uh, the where the ioct also comes to your help is uh, especially in the cases where the vitreous hemorrhage preoperatively where we don't do the oct and sometimes it it will be of help now coming to the the new part is the 3d visualization system as you can see a change of color color filters also extremely works better so i am now doing it under the reduced red technique so what happens with the reduced red is the the da the dazzling effect of the blood comes down so that now you can see these membranes appear almost like a fluorescent kind of thing the dissection becomes easier the, the possibility of having an iatrogenic breaks also becomes pretty much less in these when you use these filters now when i talk about the filters there is also called as the color the channels you can use like how we use in the house automation the cool colors the hot colors so you can change whatever you want whether it's a fake egg pseudo fake egg or fake egg you can change the color automation i'm just showing it in three windows as how you can change it and how it looks and if you are a good photographer then definitely you love how to uh, know these color saturation hue gamma all these things can be played around with now coming to the next is this was the case of uh, uh, this is a 27 gauge a simple uh, case of pdr surgery but what i wanted to show here is uh, using the color channels here uh, as you see i am trying to remove this epiretinal membrane and once i remove this epiretinal membrane uh, the the interesting thing which we are now doing is using the monochrome now earlier i used to do with the yellow filter which used to increase the contrast sensitivity now you see with the help of this uh, uh, the monochrome you see how nicely the ilm gets delineated so that the pinch and peel the the pinches what we do it gets decreased but the other disadvantage of using this monochrome is you can see the blood gets completely disappeared it doesn't look like that uh, it doesn't get appeared at all so you have to be really careful uh but definitely it's a it's a good tool to use if you are uh, not having a uh, not getting a good ilm peel in a single sheet then to avoid multiple uh, pinches on the retina then this monochromes really helps much and much better so we are doing a lot of uh, studies on the other color channels as well probably i'll be explaining it uh, little, um, in in some other 
uh, some other time so this i just wanted to show it to the uh, for the teaching purpose uh, this was the case where most of them asked what is segmentation or delamination so here again it was a case of trd uh, where the my usual choice how we do faco and try to cut it into multiple pieces so here as you see here although we can uh, resort to the bimanual technique because it is the best and the safest but with the advancement of these cutters then most of this can be done with the help of cutter itself so as you see here the periphery i first try to cut it down and once i do a 360 truncation around that membrane and then i go ahead and try to do a, a cutter segmentation so here uh, i i just cut it into multiple pieces here uh, as you can see uh, in this and then the delamination becomes more and more easier uh the membranes come comes to the cutter very easily and uh, there was no use of forceps or scissors in these in these cases and this was the post op result in that case i think i'll uh, conclude uh thank you very much uh, for the opportunity madam thank you very much excellent videos so uh let us see much what is your most uh, preferred technique to deal any complex uh, pdr cases like with uh, complicated uh, like uh, recombinogenous tractional detachment combined cases crd so, uh, yeah i would go uh, by manual or on the, uh, only with the cutter uh, very good question sir if it's a detached retina then definitely my my threshold for using the bimanual very is very high yes. but if it's the attached retina i always try with the cutter first and try to jo just go underneath lift it and see if i can do uh, a segmentation and do uh, 360 degree i can cut the attachments of the vitreous along that membrane then most of the times with the help of this conformal segmentation what is yes. described where you change the attack uh, angle of the attack of these cutters the membrane comes very easily with the cutter itself there is no right. need to use the additional uh, forceps at all but definitely if it's a detached retina then it's a very risky procedure because we we usually tend to have the iatrogenic break in that case i think my threshold to use is very low okay very low thank you do you uh, in the pdr particularly do you keep your eye also on bleeding and hemostasis because sometimes that can totally compromise your surgery do you think that's a factor or you don't you don't seem to have uh definitely madam otherwise the surgery becomes more and more cumbersome especially when you have a break we have a membrane and it's bleeding i think these are all the very bad combination so, so yeah. in these cases keep on hemostasizing as as much possible uh, uh, but when it comes more closer to the posterior to the retina then i use a pfo and it try to control the bleeding uh, i don't use much of these uh, in, uh, increasing the infusion to 60 because i i somehow believe although i don't have any good evidence that the disc pallor and uh, ensuing the disc pallor might happen in these cases so i try to either cauterize it or use a pfo and try to dissect this membranes under the pfo yeah ultimately visual prognosis can be affected if you increase the pressure yeah for long time yeah thank you that's true I think we go to the next talk by Dr. Gopal Pillai. Uh, let me just open. What's the talk? Um, thank you very much, ma'am. I'm sorry for the intrusion. I, I, my own IC is happening on another place. That is why I'm very sorry. Uh, so I am talking today about giant retinal tears. So what is so giant about the giant retinal tears? Full thickness circumferential tears more than three clock hours are often associated with vitreous detachment. That is usually what is said. Uh, giant retinal tear more than three clock hours is about 90 degrees. So etiology wise idiopathic is very common more than 50 percentage trauma high myopia aphakic sense would affix and there will be certain people with predilection genetically like marfans and sticklers etc uh, demographically it occurs only only about 1 to 2 percentage of the total retinal detachment average age is about the fourth decade and males are more than females and 13 percentage of the grds are bilateral and 50 percentage uh, you know risk of a contralateral retinal detachment if there is grt in the other eye so we have to differentiate a giant retinal dialysis from the giant retinal tear in a giant retinal dialysis there will be a vitreous remains adherent to the posterior aspect of the tear so retina is not very mobile unlike that in a giant retinal tear what happens is the vitreous the pvd is occurring at that point and so the retina starts crumpling and there is a total mobility and that leads to huge pvr 
and so rolling on itself and then crumpling up into a PVR is very common in giant retinal tear if it is not treated earlier enough. So the management is challenging because of the PVR changes to the extreme peripheral nature of the large tear which is there. So if you have to remove the vitreous at that particular area, sometimes you may have to remove the lens as well. Epiretinal membranes between the inverted retinal flap makes unfolding very difficult. And sometimes the radial rips may be present, which, mat which whenever we are doing a, a, a air fluid exchange or a PFCL, they, they may rip off also. There is a higher chance of slippage because there is a large area of a tear and it may completely slip down if it is not supported well enough. So we have to choose between lens sparing surgery, which we used to do quite a number of times before. But once the wide angle has come in, the, in, the, in the, and the visualization is much better, now generally lens sparing vitrectomy is much less uh, done. So um, management options initially, I mean, this is historically a great management option, like the patient is lying prone and somebody is, uh, you know, doing it from below upwards. So that is all gone now. Introduction of MIBS with PFCL is one of what is uh, usually done. Sometimes I use air, sometimes I use PFCL. It depends upon the amount of PVR, etc. Increased primary attachment rates is very high, actually. 58 to 94% is literate lit in the literature. But I think all of us uh, would have a very good primary attachment rate. But sometimes post-SOR, the chances of redetachment are also a little higher in GRTs. So uh, the first thing in uh, this thing would be to find out whether uh, lens sparing PPV versus uh, lensectomy PPV. Uh, in, a, in an extremely peripheral place where there is a lot of PVR and membrane peeling needs to be done in the extreme periphery, then we may have to uh, require to remove the lens. And usually a lensectomy is not what is preferred. Probably you would do a phaco emulsification now and then go there. And PPV with or without buckling, generally buckle is now avoided because it would not help a lot in slippage also. And with the wide angle visualization systems, we can see up till the periphery and do it. And so buckle is not generally preferred. I think there can be a difference in opinion in the panel as well. The main focus points would be that the flap edge needs to be supported by uh, appropriate retinopics, be it cryo, be it uh, uh, laser, anything like that. And removal of the periretinal membranes which avoids the repositioning of the flap. And uh, if there is a, a PVR, then we may require to do retinotomies and retinectomies to, uh, if there is shortening. And the extreme peripheral bit of the giant retinal tear, that flap of the retina, needs to be cut off to prevent uh, further problems. So I told about the buckling, uh, dialysis in early cases, flap is not inverted, PVR uh, up to grade B, clear lens. Then that, that in a giant retinal dialysis, we can still do a just a scleral buckling and get out of it. Especially because most of these would be young people, myopes, etc. So buckling can avoid a lot of, lot of other intraocular issues. But isolated buckling procedures are uh, now lesser and lesser performed, especially in giant retinal tears. Uh, it's directly, we will go into an MIVS and most cases can be used as an adjunct, PFCL can be used as an adjunct. So uh, lens trauma, self-sealing, reduced surgical time and complication, that's the MIVS advantages. And problems associated with the slower uh, removal of the vitreous and difficulty to the reach, the flap and aura. So lens, lens can touch and at that point of time we may have to convert to a lensectomy or lens removal. Uh, prolonged time for air fluid exchange to prevent uh, uh, slippage and need extra caution. And if you're using a PFCL, always make sure that it doesn't have any subretinal migration of PFCL. So uh, in phakic patient, it is sometimes difficult to shave the vitreous up to the base and remove the flap, but then you can intend with one hand, you use a chandelier, intend with one hand, the other hand you can do that. And uh, laser also, sometimes it is difficult, but you can intend with one hand and use laser. So that's a surgeon's decision. And circling band can be applied before PPV. Again, it, I don't, I don't, I'm not a big fan of that because it doesn't prepare, pre prevent slippage. PFCL is a third hand which helps flatten uh, and hold it in position while you do the peripheral vitrectomy. Every, the retina will be very stable and also it helps us if you completely fill the eye with PFCL, it avoids slippage, etc. Chandelier illumination is required now because uh, we will require three ports because we will require direct PFCL silicon oil exchange also. So these are some of the surgical steps. We'll go to the surgery. All the anterior retinal flap and vitreous up to the uh, vitreous base needs to be removed. If left, increased chance of proliferation and PVR. Laser, I, I put four or five layers of laser all around 360 degrees and uh, maybe cryo to the anterior part of the flap as well. So that is a typical case pre-operatively and post-operatively you can see the laser marks as well. Air fluid exchange, it's imperative to remove all the fluid up to the PFC ledge to avoid slippage and PFC will be expanded with non-expanded concentrated gas. 
but I generally tend to ex uh, you know exchange POC with silicon oil. Silicon oil is uh, what I usually do. Other I about 13% chances of GRT is there and 40% risk of retinal detachment is there. Any lesion in any retinal detachment we will treat. Here also we will definitely treat prophylactic barrage. Uh, prophylactic buckling which is earlier uh, advocated is a little bit of a controversy. So now we will go to a small video about a one minute video of uh, giant retinal tear. Uh, so this is it. So here we are uh, doing, I mean you can see that it is a fairly early giant retinal tear. Here you are removing the vitreous and you can see the area of the tear there. Uh, uh, you know that is the area of the tear. It's slightly inverted but not so much PVR. So this is a case which can be amenable to just uh, air fluid exchange also so we will try that out first after the vitrectomy is over i did a retinotomy and tried it and but uh, in the periphery it was not completely flattening so that i have to uh, use pfcl now now i'm i'm filling pfcl right till day so when i'm using pfcl generally i'll tend to use a uh, fourth port because uh, now because of the valved cannulas it's extremely difficult for something to be injected without a vent so you require automatically a fourth port. This is intentation and you can do vitrectomy also intended and you can also do laser intended there so that you know you completely uh, do that. Now this is direct PFCL silicon oil exchange. You can see that the silicon tip is on the left hand and it is sucking this PFCL out and once it is sucked a little bit then we will inject silicon oil with the other hand. That is how you fill and finish uh, PFCL silicon oil exchange. Thank you very much. A nice presentation Dr. Gopal. I have a like... Uh very little question. Preoperatively, you diagnose a patient with uh, giant retinal tear, but while you are starting the case, just then you have realized it is not giant retinal tear, it is giant dialysis. Will it change your mode of treatment? Will you go for the scleral buckle rather than doing vitrectomy, or you will stick to your vitrectomy? When did we understand that it is a giant retinal dialysis? On table. On table. On which, table. Which means the preoperative evaluation was not proper. It was not proper means you, the, the picture was such, you thought just have a glimpses look that it is a giant retinal tear. But actually it is a giant retinal dialysis. So will it change your mode of treatment or not? Um, once you are entered inside the eye generally then I may not uh, change the mode of treatment unless yes. uh, the patient is very high myope, a child, a young person with in which uh, it is extremely difficult to remove the vitreous right till the even beyond the aura. In such a case, because you need to remove the vitreous right till, in, if it is a dialysis, we need to uh, remove the vitreous right till the aura, which may not be possible in that. So I may, I may, if I go inside, I may do it, but I may supplement it with the buckle. Okay, thank you. See, I mean, uh, if there is a giant dialysis, the problems would be the same. So why would the treatment be very different if and if it is there is no reversal of the fluid uh, flap yeah, you okay. can go with the okay. scleral buckle also yeah okay thank you thank, thank you dr pillik good videos yeah thank Thanks. you very much thank you. i'm extremely sorry i have to run to the my my own ic sorry Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you uh, at the outset to Dr. Malika for this opportunity. I'm going to be talking about acquired retinoschisis related RDs, which necessarily might not be complicated, but they're but but they're different. They need to one they need to be <coughs> diagnosed properly and then have a bit of a variation in the management. And I'll be soon showing a few cases. So when you talk about retinoschisis and typically non-tractional retinoschisis, you know you have your X-linked or your congenital retinoschisis, but you also have the senile. The, the main difference between that and the more common, uh, you know, and the XLRS, the commoner variety of these senile retinoschisis is that the, that the split is in the relatively outer retina, it's in the outer plexiform layer. However, there is a rarer subtype of the senile or the acquired retinoschisis, which is bullous to look at, but it's called reticular because the split is, is, is more superficial in the same layer as is in the X-linked retinoschisis. And because the split is in the inner layer, it tends to be more bullous. 
uh, it's not as rare as one might think. There is hardly any data from pigmented races, right? You, most of this data comes from landmark one, uh, you know, work done in the mid '80s by Dr. Bayer. He, you know, he's the one who actually actually told us about whether you want to laser asymptomatic lattices or not, and you know all of that. So he followed up these patients, and the prevalence is seven percent in patients over 40 years of age in Caucasians, which is much more than than that of lattice degeneration which all of us retina specialists diagnose every, you know, left, right, center every single day. But uh, somehow these patients tend not to be picked up either because of A, ignorance, B, lack of understanding, or, and C, just because these are generally a lot less associated with retinal detachment. The chances that they will progress to detachment are, are lower, and patients, despite having a bullous elevation in the peripheral retina, remain asymptomatic until they get the, you know, retinal detachment. You know, it looks, you know, uh, similar. It's, it, you know, it is, it is, it is, it, it can be shallow or elevated depending on one of, on, on one of, one of these two varieties. It, because it's retinoschisis, you can have the hold in the inner layer or multiple holes in the outer layer. There is difference in the holes of the inner and outer, uh, outer layers. The outer layer holes are much more prominent looking. They are bigger, they are lesser in number, and they're typically, they look like large holes, which you will see generally full thickness holes in the retina. The inner layer holes almost resemble sieve-like retina. They're easy to miss on a cursory examination. They are generally multiple. The inner layer tends to be thinner. And only when the outer and inner layer holes are present in, over the same area and there is a flow for the vitreous to get from the vitreous cavity into one of the sheets and then into the subretinal space will you get the regmatogenous RD in this, right? So the issues and why we want to be, so this is one entity we can't change. This is, this is, this is what you get. You know, people with microcystoid degeneration can get it. We can manage the complication and the complication is retinal detachment. There are two kinds. One is the schesis detachment. And this is a photo which is right there. A representative photo that I've taken. It almost looks like this has been barraged off. This hasn't. So typically, as you would see in chronic retinal detachments, that the body would try and limit the detachment. There'll be RPE changes and there'd be a demarcation line. We generally see it semicircular or arc-like because retinal detachments then tend to be like that. A schesis detachment is you have multiple outer layer holes thus in the layer of the, in the area of the schesis. And because of that, there is retinal detachment in the layer of the schesis, but it's not beyond it. And it stays there for a very, very, very long time. So it's a localized round retinal detachment. And all around 360 degree, there will be pigmentation. It's very similar, the phenomenon being similar to what you have as a demarcation line. And these progress extremely slowly, if ever, to retinal detachment and require observation. What we want to intervene for and the stage that, and the cases that I'll be showing are of the second variety, which is the progressive regmatogenous RD. Again, very rare, 0.05%. And typically, if you, as I, as I mentioned previously, you need for the vitreous to be able to get into the retina, into the schesis below the retina, and then it's gonna happen. So you need an inner layer break, you need an outer layer break, you need those breaks to be aligned for the fluid to be able to go in, and then it's going to actually progress from a schesis RD into a progressive retinal detachment. I'm going to sh be showing four represent representative cases quickly. One will have a video. Uh, this is the first one. This is a patient who actually came with sudden vision loss, you know, had a typical curtain-like effect. That's the ultra-wide field fundus photo of the right eye. Uh, that is an artifact. And you'll soon see uh, in the surgical video why that is not. And you'll also see, you know, why uh, large, uh, as I said earlier, the outer layer holes tend to be large, round, one, two, three, inner layer. And you can see the retinal vessels going over them. So you're very clear that this is schesis. You know, there, there's a sheet of retina over it. Inner layer holes are hardly seen there. This patient was planned for a combined buccal weight. And this is what we did. The idea is to... Yeah, so this is, uh, you know, me tying the 240 band. And then uh, I moved on to the vitrectomy part of it, 25 gauge three port standard vitrectomy, which is my go-to vitrectomy for all cases. The idea to show this is the surgery is not any different from a lot of other detachments, but the intra-op video uh, after the uh, hyaloid removal, which will be, uh, you know, canacord assisted will be shown uh, just shortly. Uh, the, the video will show the inner layer and the outer layer breaks and the anatomy a lot better. 
So again, as is paramount for any detachment case, the hyloid has to come off. Uh, I think that's not going to change no matter what the etiology or variety of the retinal detachment. And right there, you can see that, uh, you know, those are your round, large outer retinal breaks. One, the cutter is going to soon, soon kind of rotate, yeah, show, show it uh, like that. Two and three, and which was also seen on the ultra wide field photo, you'll soon see some of the inner, 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 finer inner retinal breaks also on top of them. If you could, if you could notice right on top, there are certain ones there as well. They weren't very well seen. Uh, they, they were seen well on the uh, clinical exam. They weren't very well seen there. And those, and those inner retinal breaks are actually there over those outer retinal breaks. And hence the conduit, what you got, there was also some hemorrhage in the periphery. That, that, that white area right there is the, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of the second thing that you saw on the photo. That was the area of fibrosis. The rest of the surgery is fairly similar. You detach the hyaloid, you ensure that you've, you've you know, done what you've done. There was a, uh, you know, I thought a suspicious area uh, just posterior to that as well, which had a break. I actually removed that. Uh, I'm just going to quickly go forward. And after that, you do a fluid air exchange. Uh, the difference in what you want to do after, uh, you know, uh, a first di diagnosing is is that again you you flatten all of this, and then to ensure that both the leaflets of the retinoschisis stick together, you laser all over them. You ensure that all of those two layers of retinoschisis stick to each other, and that primarily is because if this patient has a recurrence later on of either a retinal detachment or a retinoschisis, you would never know clinically as to what that is, uh, whether you would have to reintervene or not. So the idea is once you're inside the eye, you ensure that both the flaps are stuck together and not just to pexy to the outer and inner layer holes so that, you know, there is no recurrence of either schisis or detachment in that area. I, I, I finished this, 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 this case with gas and, you know, this lady did okay. Uh, this is another patient I'm showing similar. I'm sorry, this image is rotated a bit. I, I, I tried to correct it. It, uh, it wasn't happening. The upper temporal, uh, you know, retinoschisis. And you can very well see the difference in the area of the schisis and the detachment. So the area of the schisis is from there to there. It's smooth. It's more translucent. You can see the choroidal kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, vessels there a lot better. That is the tear right there. That's a full thickness horseshoe tear. And that is the area of the regmatogenous retinal detachment. It's opaque. It has corrugations. And that's what's caused the, uh, you know, patient to be symptomatic. I'm just finishing in one minute. And again, this patient was managed with vitrectomy. And that's what the outcome was. Again, barraged both the layers of the what, what was the schesis together. And hence those confluence scars. And this patient did well. Again, you know, operate this patient with uh, uh, wit, buckle, and uh, gas. This is another patient. And this is just basically to show that you know, you have these two areas. This part, that is the schesis part, and that is the progressive retinal detachment. That is the break right there. That's the blown up photo. It clearly shows that the part of the schesis right there is transparent. You can look at the core. You, you can make out the choroidal vessels a lot better, whereas the retinal, typically as you would have in retinal detachment, there is loss of retinal transparency. There are corrugations. And so that is the schesis part. And that is where this progressive RD has actually gone in. And the patient will only be symptomatic once the fluid gets in there. This patient was eventually just managed with a scleral buckle and did fine. And just one last case to show, uh, uh, you know, I, I remember showing my fellow this and my fellow, you know, the previous case. And a month later, we, shot, we, we saw this one. And she said that, sir, ye bhi retinoschisis RD hai acquired wala. And again, you can see that this is, uh, that's the schesis part. And that there is the altered loss of transparency, the progressive retinal detachment. The patient's only going to get symptomatic once that happens. Again, so I said, you diagnosed it, buckle her. So she buckled her. It's a bit of a posterior buckle effect, uh, you know, because the break was right there in the periphery. It did not need to be buckled that much. But I just wanted to show this because it's the most recent of the one that we had. She buckled this. The idea is you can, fixing these is not difficult. You can fix them with buckle or vitrectomy. The idea is diagnosing. And the, more, and the main important difference is not to go chasing, looking at the other eye. This is not X-linked retinoschisis. And you want to try and plaster both the sh uh, sheets together with laser so as to prevent any doubt whether it's a recurrence of RD post-op or recurrent of schesis post-op. Thank you. Thank you, Mohit, for the beautiful videos. I have two questions for you. One is, how would you manage the schesis where the RD is not due to the schesis, 
but you have a peripheral schesis with the inner or outer retinal holes. Yes, uh, so uh, the RD, I mean, I mean uh, the management would be would be the same, uh, but I would also uh, still uh, want to flatten the uh, flatten both the layers of, of the schesis because I think I think more so in this scenario one would have a bigger dilemma in the post-op period whether it's remnant schesis or it's uh, a recurrence of the detachment. So we'll never know for sure and we'll just be guessing post-op. Since we'll be inside the eye, if I'm if 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 vitrectomy is something that I'm planning, I would want to you would la clear laser it all over it. However, it. if I'm buckling, I would ignore that area. I would just treat the area which has the break and treat that area per se. And secondly, how like you said, really, if it's a schesis, you really did there has to be inner retinal holes and you may not be able to identify. Right. So do you think it's important to spend time pre-op or intra-op with OCTs and all? Or you just treat it like the entire area? Would so, you waste time on identifying holes? I think if you're doing vitrectomy, it might not be that, that prudent to do it, ma'am. But if, if one's planning buckling, and l l let's say for the first patient, which had l larger uh, you know, outer retinal holes, multiple inner retinal holes, that was buckleable, that, but, but that would have been very challenging. How much do you cryo? What do you cryo? What not? So for those patients, if there is any doubt, I'd recommend vitrectomy. And in those patients, not looking at that, uh, you know, th that maybe closely pre-op. But if one is planning to do a buckle, then I think it's then paramount. Otherwise, there will be failure of surgery. Fair enough. Thank you. Sir. So, uh, uh, basically, you have planned for beer, uh, not to go for the buckling. But in these cases where there is there are multiple inner retinal holes, yeah and the outer retinal holes maybe one or two yeah will you plan to do to do the superficial retinectomy overlaying the schisis part uh, yeah it's generally not needed sir because again uh, different the 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 difference of this from x, x linked retinoschisis is that x linked the the split is in the nerve fiber layer yes. so the inner layer of the schisis which we generally remove is, is two layers of the retina and we have eight layers there now the the most commonest variety of this which is 90 percent of the cases the split is outer plexiform so we have six inner retinal layers and four outer retinal layers now if we were to remove and this is just i'm you're thinking out loud if we were to remove six inner retinal layers i think that would just amount to a very large retinectomy in, and and then all the complications of a re large retinectomy would ensue which we don't see in xlrs because the outer retina the eight layers are still intact so, so i would tep typically not sir now basically if there are very one or two outer retinal holes and multiple inner retinal holes. So you cannot, it is very difficult to identify the inner retinal holes. Rather, identifying all the holes, you can do, just do that they are actually not uh, important for the peripheral field of vision. Sure. So you can just do the retina, superficial retinectomy, leave the outer retina, and do the laser around the outer retinal holes yes. so that your retinal judgment will not Or we could just stick stick both these together. So it will not expose your RP much so no. that it will not increase the chance of PBR. Sick point. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I think our next speaker is our chief instructor, Malika. Thank you, uh, Dr. Vishali. So uh, I'll s basically, I'm trying to show a concept here, um, which I recently uh, re I realized is useful. Fibrin glue to close retinal breaks in combined fractional regmatogenous retinal detachment, secondary to PDR, with silicon oil in situ. So this is a. Yeah. So fibrin glue has been used for ages in systemic surgery for various indications and also more recently in retinal surgery and more lately uh, by Dr. Mudit Tyagi it has been shown uh, for retinal closing retinal breaks in regmatogenous RDs but uh, those are not with leaving silicon oil in situ and, uh, and also for closing macular holes. So we encountered this patient uh, who had bilateral PDR and combined RDs, very poor vision. So, you know, very often what happens is that um, we lose track of the area which is bleeding and keep working in the other areas, even did scatter laser uh, for the other areas. And by the time I realized that I had to close the brakes, the brakes were already obscured by blood and other things. So we did a fluid air exchange and tried <coughs> tried to remove the blood, but the view was too uh, poor and laser could not be done through the blood. There are two breaks in that area which need treatment. So after several attempts, I thought that maybe in any case we would lose the eye. 
so i injected uh, this is being injected fibrin glue and it comes as two different parts first from uh, fibrinogen and then thrombin so you have to inject it separately over the two breaks had to dry the area and then injected silicon oil 5000 centistokes and you can see that at even at one week it was attached which it generally may not if you leave the breaks open and then you ask the patient to position it takes time for the srf to resolve and uh, we followed this patient up uh, and you see the glue is resolving very rapidly and it is no longer seen at 5 weeks at the two points pressure remained normal uh, and the oil has not uh, been affected vision has improved very rapidly from hand movements to 660 and 36 then this was another lady uh, who had a surgery for rd combined rd but uh, the break didn't close in the first surgery so again we were to lose this eye anyway uh, so thought that i would try this in the resurgery there was a break superior to the macula um that video is not here uh so so i had to do a more membrane peeling along uh, around that break to make sure that it would settle and then used fibrin glue to open, close that break and you can see that at one week the entire retina is settled you can see what was the picture previously and now and without requiring any post op positioning uh this was actually done before the uh, case which i showed earlier so we had used little more glue here and this is the picture at 3 weeks but she came back a few days back which is 8 months post operative and the entire glue has gone retina is attached vision is good and there is uh, oil has not been affected so to conclude fibrin glue can be an useful adjunct in the management of combined rds uh, with complex breaks with silicon oil in c2 especially with proliferative diabetic retinopathy where laser for breaks is not possible for due to bleeding or other reasons but it has to be ensured that membrane peeling is complete there is no traction on the breaks and the surface has to be dry otherwise the fibrin doesn't work and post operative positioning uh, is not needed that is an additional advantage and the rapid resolution of srf is also another advantage and the silicon oil did not uh, emulsify even at 8 months though we did use higher viscosity oil in these cases thank you Uh, you mean to say you put it on the blood, madam? In case there is a blood yes, yes, over covered yes. with the break. Yeah, we yeah. So in one of, one of the break was seen through the blood, but ah. it was not the laser was not happening. The other break could not even be seen well, but we knew where it was. So after multiple attempts at removing the blood, what when the blood cl- the uh, it gets lysed or uh, the blood clot, doesn't it get retracted and? because in most of the cases where we have seen even uh, uh, when you see look at the foreign authors they say that just leave silicon oil if you are putting a 5000 centistokes silicon oil you don't need to laser at all but somehow i am i am no, no, a different opinion break. but in these cases when you know that you can't do a laser there is a thick film of blood and you put a fibrin glue when that blood starts retracting will will it will not the the edges get lifted or uh, no uh, see as it is the blood forms a, a kind of a tamponade over the break but that's not lasting the glue probably just adds to it and you have a, a tamponade for the time that you need you you have done laser but you haven't been able to see the uh, burns so possibly you have some laser effect which you can supplement post operatively as the blood resolves but i didn't have to supplement the laser also in these patients and then in every case the view is not the only problem like the second case when i went for a resurgery it was not the view that was the problem but it was it had a failed rd because of the open break so i just thought that since the laser didn't work the first time actually going and sealing it plugging it may work and so there blood was not an issue but it still helped to salvage a redetachment or a failed detachment in how many cases you have used this no, only two only two cases because it just started october this year last year okay and even i think dr mudith has done a large series where yeah, that is done. different that's what i was that showing that was for the simple regard that, that is why i started because for the retinal that is just a simple detachment simple where uh, there is no oil and i think he removes the glue also he just puts it and then uh, mm. removes it but the the concern here is whether you can leave it in c2 with oil in the eye for several months that has not been done not reported also choice of tamponade in these cases madam when you use the fibrin glue i mean in these two cases it was oil only because the detachments are also very bad can you use gas in these cases and ask them to put i mean why not the choice would not change i guess so because in fact in these once you have plugged the holes 
you don't even need much tamponade because you do you see in these patients uh, on in the first one week there is no fluid and there was no post op positioning also so i think tamponade is not even important in these cases even the air tamponade might work may the, the plug is fibrin blue is temporary it's not permanent sorry fibrin blue is the, uh, temporary it's not permanent yeah, yeah of course it is not permanent uh, but by that time it will uh, automatically biodegrade by a period of 15 days so if the attachment by 15 days is okay then uh, you don't have to give a tamponade but if you feel ki uh, that uh, attachment is not good and you need to give a tamponade then you have to fill have it. to because it's a biodegradable yeah yeah absolutely and leaving inside the eye doesn't makes a difference doesn't make makes a difference yeah that's right which because it's a biological thing that's right yeah. as we saw in four weeks it is disappearing in both cases so thank you madam in the interest of the time i thank think you. we could have a little more questions on the fibrin glue <laughs> but because of the time we are i'd exceeded like to thank by the esteemed panelists and speakers thank and you. the audience uh, for their patient listening thank you very much